such a privilege to be together and worship and feel that moving of the Spirit on our, on our lives with the songs that Kevin has Kevin picked out for us to to sing and, and fellowship in and, and just rejoice in the Lord of all that that he has provided for us and that's what we'll celebrate this morning at communion all that he has provided for us through his coming taking on flesh living anointed by the Holy Spirit as he submitted to the Father even though he was 100% God he was also 100% man to do all of that and then take our sins our all the things on us in his body being nailed to a cross and giving his blood for us so that we can be lifted up to the heavenly places because of what he has done as we humble ourselves before him and realize it's all him it's everything that he has done and so that's going to be kind of the theme because what we're going to work to today is labor day god's way we're going to look at, at labor and work, uh, laboring and working and, and doing that type of thing. We're going to start with, with Jesus and we're going to go to then what He has done for us. And then we're going to end with how that is to work out in us to be God's laborers. To be what He wants us to be doing the work that He wants us to do since, since it's Labor Day. And I, and I looked, and, and uh, I don't know how many of you know that the concept of celebrating Labor Day goes back to the late 18th century. As there was a getting together and organizing of what we would call of what I had been basically all of my life growing up on the farm, first as a farm kid, and then blue collar work is basically what I've done all of my life to that, that hard working labor that our nation relies on, well, that's where the concept of selling labor, labor, celebrating Labor Day come from. But I want to make it as the Lord has been working on my heart, and it's kind of a, a process in motion about what that means for us to be laboring for God and how we accomplish that. And so that's so it's celebrating Labor Day God's way. And by the way, I just want to share with you one of the, I heard, I can't remember, it's an instructor I had in college or a, a, a pastor, but but talk about particularly in in uh, places where there are cities and towns where you have municipalities. One of the most important jobs that gets worked, that basically is what we consider really low class, and yet is one of the most necessary things there is. You know what that is. The garbage collectors, the trash collectors. Just think of what happens in a, in a, you know, I grew up on the farm, so we took care of all that ourselves. But when you're living with a whole bunch around a whole bunch of people, like most of us do, we can't do that. And so those people uh, are really one of the most important jobs there is. And what he was talking, what that teacher or pastor or preacher was talking about is that when we're doing something, if we're, if we're doing it, particularly as a Christian, we're doing and honoring Him with it, it is the most important job there is, whatever it is that we're doing for Him. So it's Labor Day God's way. So that's what we're going to look at. Uh, let's put up the first scripture, and, and then, we'll, then we'll, we'll pray. But that's kind of where this, is, where this is headed, about Labor Day God's way before we celebrate what Jesus did through what the work that He did to make it possible for us to be saved, know that we're going to spend eternity with Him, and then to be empowered to live out our lives right now. So that's kind of that's kind of where we're headed. And so we'll just read this. This is in John chapter 6. Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God that you believe in Him whom He sent. And we'll put that into context here in a little bit. So what is the work of God? Believing in Jesus. The one who was sent. That is the work 
of God. So when we do this today and we listen to the word and we celebrate communion and we go fellowship together, it's all about believing in Jesus. Amen. That is the work of God, Amen. believing in Jesus. Father, we just thank you and we pray as we go through these scriptures, Lord, that you will just speak to our hearts that the work that Jesus accomplished on the cross given to us through the power of the resurrection to cause us to be able to be your sons and daughters, to be your children, to have our sins removed, our sins removed and covered by the blood of Christ, that we can stand before you in righteousness and in sanctification, being set apart to be holy, that it's all a part of what Jesus did. So as we celebrate that today, Open our hearts to fully understand more and more what it means to surrender and humble ourselves to you so that we can be lifted up to that place you want us to be in to share you and to live for you and be the light in the darkness. We just ask for that to be made real to us like never before. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. The... the it's interesting when I was starting to study this, and it's been going on now for quite a few weeks, about how many scriptures there are that we could look at, and we're going to have a whole bunch, and I don't want to make it too long because I want us to celebrate communion and enjoy it and, and then not make us behind for all of their work that's going on next door for us to have fellowship dinner. But Jesus, to talk a little bit about what Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe on him whom he sent. And there are, I just wrote them down, there are three basic words uh, used in Greek uh, for, for, that are translated labor, work, or, or that, that type of thing, or working. Uh, and they, they can mean, one, we get our word uh, ergonomics from it. If you know, you know what ergonomics is, that's the study of work methods. So that whatever you're doing, whatever your call would, would be, in the line that you're doing, they make it the most efficient and make it so it doesn't hurt you physically. That's what ergonomics is, and so it comes from that Greek word ergon. And so that's one of the words that is used. The next word is used as energeia. And you may, it may come to you, that's where our word energy comes from. And so most of the time, that word is used about what God's energy does for us. He gives us that. And then there's another word, and I won't pronounce it in the Greek, but it's an interesting word, and it means difficult, strenuous toil. And uh, I don't know how many of you have ever had a job like that. Anybody ever had a job where it was unbelievable toil? Yeah. It's been just a few years ago now that I, I, whenever I see a concrete truck, I'm so glad I don't have anything to do with it. Because for so long, I was ordering it, and then I was helping place the stuff. And I, I see these guys working over what they've been doing in Hayesville, and it's hot and sunny and whatever, and watch them down there placing it. And one of the hardest jobs I ever had was to work with some of the tremendous finishers we had at both Boeing, when I was working for Boeing, and then for, for uh, EB, some of the great finishers and, and workers that we had, but one of the hardest things is screeding and screeding the concrete. And you're down there, and you're pulling, and it's a strain, and, and it's hot and all that, and then after that comes all the hard work of getting it floated and troweled in, because a lot of times you can't use a power trowel in places, so you're doing all of this. And so that's what that word means. And I also remember when I was a lot younger, when we were pastoring, I learned to, to shingle, put on shingles when, when I was working, working at that, and the, the, the church couldn't support us, and so we were supporting ourselves. I worked with my brother-in-law learning, learning how to shingle because he had, had worked so many years shingling. And that is one of the hardest jobs I ever remember in my life, was carrying bundles of shingles up a ladder and then being up there in the bright sunshine and working and straining to do all that. Well, that's what this word means. It means to be under, under a, a, a real strain. It's not used very often, but we'll look at one of those words about what it means to really be in toil and to, and to be doing it, and, and so we're going to look at that. But anyway, that's, that's the words. Uh, 
And the, the word that, that Jesus used here is, is uh, Aragon ergonomics. But it's the, that's, that's the work for us is to believe in him who he has sent. So that's going to be the ultimate thing. So we're going to look at what Jesus has done and then we're going to look how we respond to it. Let's go to the next one. John 17, 4. Now, you probably remember if you've been in any of John's teachings, but John 17 is basically what the Lord's Prayer is. That's where Jesus is alone and He's praying to the Father. Uh, and we have the example of the Lord's Prayer. He teaches the disciples. And that, that, is, that is what prayer is for us. But this is His prayer in the garden. And He said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work you have given me to do. And He wasn't quite done yet, but He's to the point where that He knows that's what's going to take place. What is the work that he is, that God the Father has given him? To save me and you. To pay the price for our sins to be forgiven. And he's done that. And one of the things he's going to cry on the cross, one of the last words, it is finished. Because the price has been paid. And in, and in the synopsis he talks about the veil being rent from top to bottom. Because now, because of what He has done and sacrificed, you and I, when we humble ourselves, could go right into the presence of God Almighty. And we can be there because of His blood that we're going to celebrate, that His body and His blood given for us. So it is finished. So everything that we're going to look about, about how it works out in us, happens because of what Jesus did first. Planned before the foundation of the world, it says in, in one of the scriptures, that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world. That was the plan. Before Jesus, as the creative agent, ever spoke everything into existence that now exists, according to John chapter 1, the first four verses. Everything we have comes from Him. And so this is that person who stepped out of that realm of being able to speak and have universes formed. To have stars come into existence that we can't even imagine. That's this person who's in the garden paying the price and will go to the cross so that you and I can celebrate all that we have in Christ. So it's all through Him. Now let's go to the next one. Most of these are scriptures we, we know. And this is, this is such a fabulous scripture. For by grace you have been saved through Faith. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. Saved is that whole thing about what salvation is. And it's through faith. And we'll talk about faith a little later. Not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. There's never a time that you and I can ever take a stand and say, look at what I've done and actually take credit for it. Because you don't get to take the next breath unless God allows it and causes it. Period. And then Paul writes in one of his letters, there's nothing you have that you haven't been given. You didn't bring yourself into existence. That came from mom and dad. And so everything that we have, including how we live and move and have our being, comes from God. So it's not of ourselves and definitely not the spiritual stuff to be sons and daughters of God. It happens because we believe in what Jesus did. Lest any of you should boast. And that is the one of the key bedrock sins of all time. So that we can glory in ourselves. And if you go back to the first sin, that's sort of the thing. John brought this out in one of his messages. Brought this out about that's the bedrock of sin. So it's not that we should boast, not, not of works, lest anyone should boast, so we don't work ourselves into salvation. You can't earn it. It took Jesus to pay for it. For we are his workmanship, and I've talked about this before. You know that, what that word means? We get our word poetry from that word, poema. And what that means is, is an unbelievable <coughs> almost beyond imagination craftsmanship thing 
that somebody puts together. And if you've ever been around a craftsman, regardless of what trade they're in, and see somebody who can do something so well, so perfect, because God has given him ability, that's what this work means. So we are his workmanship, meaning we, what is produced in us is because God did it. We are his workmanship. So that, bring, that brings us to a point. If we look at ourselves, what do we, how, how do we look in comparison to what God wants us to be? And that's, by the way, not to bring guilt. That's just to cause us to realize that it's His workmanship. It's His power. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works. So everything that Jesus has done for us to make it possible to do is to be worked out in us so that we can do good works. Do good things. Not to be saved, but because God has saved us. Because God has saved us. <laughs> Which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And you know what that means? To make it an everyday lifestyle. So that it's something that we do as a consistent practice because that's what God has provided for us. We are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And the beautiful, beautiful thing about it is it starts slow and it's being compared to be, being an infant and it just gets better and better as we grow up in Christ. And so there is the joy of what He's done, but there's the hope and joy of what He's going to do in the future in my life because of Him, not because of me, but because like we sang the song that Kevin had, we humble ourselves and He does it. And so that's what it's all about. Okay. We are a short workmanship created to do good, do, do good works, not to be saved, but because we are saved. Now, here's what God provides, and we're just going to go through this to make it possible to do this. So let's go to the next one. Therefore, having been justified by faith, and we won't get into the meaning of all those words, it's so powerful, but that means just as if I had never sinned. By faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom also we have access by grace by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And if you are, you know, familiar with Romans, this is the uh, this is the place where he says, "Therefore, Jesus has provided everything that we need, so we can be saved and have peace with God." It all comes through what Christ did. When we we'll go back to what he says, this is the work that God has sent me to do. He did it to make it possible for that to happen. And we stand in grace. We have access to that all the time. We never stop meeting God's grace, forgiveness, and mercy over us. And because of that, regardless, irrespective of if we've had some failures or not, or we've done some things that we had to repent of, and when we talk about communion, Paul talks about let's examine ourselves before we take communion. But it's also by the fact that we have this grace and we can rejoice in the hope that that's been forgiven and it's done and God is still doing the poetry thing in my life, His craftsmanship thing, making me what He wants me to be, to do His work. Let's go to the next one in Rome. There is therefore now, and this is, goes through all the, all the things that Paul went through about wrestling with the flesh which we all do, which Paul did as a believer too. By the way, he makes the point, uh, in, I think it's in, in, ch in chapter 6, in 6 or 7, where he says, I know that in my flesh, my carnal person, now my body is now the temple of the Holy Spirit, and so is yours if you've accepted Jesus as your Savior. So he's not talking about the flesh and blood, but our carnal nature, that in my carnality dwells, no good thing. And that's why we need the cross. Yeah, that's right. And that's why we need him to, we'll look at it in the next one we look at in Romans, to have a process going on inside of us. And because we put our faith in Jesus, and that word condemnation means a handing down of judgment. 
Well, why does, why does that happen? Why do I not have the handing down of judgment on me? Because Jesus took it. Yes. Amen. Jesus took it. Yeah. Everything that I deserve to go to hell because of what I am inside of me, He took. That's right. So that my destiny has been changed from hell to heaven because of Him. So it's everything that he has done. No handing down of judgment on me because Jesus took it. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. As we humble ourselves, as we present ourselves, as we fellowship with one another. By the way, that's one of the concepts of the church that's taught in scriptures. We fellowship with one another to help each other to get better and better. And what God wants us to do individually and corporately as a fellowship. All right, let's go to the next one. And John mentioned, talked about this one. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, through the mercies of God. And I just want to say in the Greek, that is such a powerful statement through the mercies of God. And what that means is everything that Paul has written previous to this in the first 11 chapters. To show that what God has provided for us to not have in condemnation, to be free and all of that because of the cross, it's by or through the mercies, the empowerment of God. And so everything that we're talking about is what He empowers us to do. And we go back, if we go back to, to and just think back about Ephesians, you don't have to go back there. But it's what He is doing through us to bring those good works. So that all happens by the mercies of God. It's all Christ through the Holy Spirit indwelling us and empowering us because of what He's done. That you present your body as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service, which means that's the only thing that makes sense. And a lot of translations add the service of worship. You know, one of the greatest aspects of worship that we can do is work for Jesus and live for Him. Amen. That is an act of worship. And so, present your bodies, your reasonable service. And then John talked about this, and do not be conformed to this world. And I don't know if you ever remember the Phillips translation, but it's one of the neatest ways that this section was ever translated. Don't let the world force you into its Mold. Whereas John was saying, I think it was last week, don't give the devil an opportunity. Close him out of that. Don't be conformed to the world because the world is evil. And all you got to do, John was praying about it and talking about it, is start looking around that the world's impact is evil. And so don't be conformed to this world. Don't let it force you into, the, into its mold. But be transformed. And that word, if you know about butterflies, metamorphosis, that's where this word comes from. Be changed from the old nature to living in the, with the new nature. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Transformed, that metamorphosis, renewing of your mind. What are we thinking about? What do we concentrate on? And this is a funny thing, but I'm going to share it. I'm soon going to have gone a week, a full week, without ever watching a Western. <laughs> now, does that earn me brownie points? No. But it means that there are more important things, and not that it's wrong to do that when you have some time, and I, on Labor Day I, I may watch something as long as it's not offensive, as long as it's not about saloons, drinking, gambling, and saloon girls. But, but anyway, by the renewing of your mind, what are we thinking about? What are we concentrating on? And there is so much in the world that we need to be aware of of what's going on but we need to come back and concentrate on what Jesus has done and what Jesus wants to do through us, irrespective of the horrible mess the world or our culture or our family may be in. So we're renewing of our mind by concentrating on Jesus. Concentrating on Jesus. 
that nothing can separate me from his love. We're on the end of Romans chapter 8. Be not but by renewing mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Working that out because of everything that he is doing in us. All right, quickly, just a few more scriptures before we take them in. Let us not grow weary in doing good. Working it out. Don't grow weary because it's what God wants. For a new season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Therefore, as we have an opportunity, let us do good, especially to those who are of the household of faith. So how do you work out your own salvation? It says in Philippians, we didn't look at that scripture. But how do we do the works that God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them in Ephesians? By not losing heart, by not growing weary, and doing good to all. Notice that. That's a tough one. Go back to the Sermon on the Mount if you want to see what that means. Because Jesus talked about that. About doing good even to those who persecute you. But at any rate, to all, but especially of those of the household of faith. Help your brothers and sisters and family members in Christ with an encouraging word, whatever it is that they need. All right, let's go to the next one. This is the, the, the five-fold ministry. And he, all, he, and he himself gave some to be apostles, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Praise the Lord for John. Notice, for the equipping of the saints to do what? The work of the ministry. No, normally, when we think of the work of the ministry, that's what we think of those first five. But no, they are there to equip you and me to do the work of the ministry. To do the work of the ministry. Sharing Jesus, however and whenever we have the opportunity for the edifying of the body of Christ. We do it together. All right. Do I have another one? Yeah. This, uh, this is such a good one. Let him who stole. This is about changing lifestyle. Let him who stole steal no longer. But rather let him labor. And that's one of those tough words. Yeah. Working with his hands what is good that he may have something to give him who has need. need. That is working out our salvation. And making it happen. Making it happen. And what do people need the most? They need to know about Jesus. Amen. If they're believers and they're having problems, when they need to know about how to have Jesus comfort them, change them, and empower them. And we as the body of Christ help that to happen. If it's somebody who doesn't know Jesus, then part of our work is to try to make it possible to share with somebody what it means about Christ. Working out the ministry that he has for us to do. And why do we do all that? We do it because Jesus has saved us. Jesus has saved us, which we're going to celebrate. And all the power, all the ability comes from him. As we humble and yield ourselves to him, then he empowers us. To do that. He empowers us to do that. So let's be thinking about that as we prepare, prepare our hearts for communion, to fellowship around this. It's everything that He has provided for us, for us to be able to do this because of what He has done for us and what He wants to accomplish through us because of the cross. Now let me just go back and say one thing. Because Paul, Paul talks about it, about before we take communion, let a person examine himself. He's talking to believers here when he writes Corinthians. And what their basic thing was, what they needed to examine was because there had become what we call schisms or divisions in the body of Christ over things that didn't really matter. And so they weren't fellowshipping together. And one of the ultimate things there was the rich and the poor, the division that was going on on that. But Paul was just saying, and, and, yeah, and by the way, it doesn't hurt before we take communion to examine if there's something in our life where we've been rebelling against God about it, and we just confess that, then do that in your own heart and mind and say, I'm, as I take these symbols, I'm presenting myself to you to work out your salvation in me because I'm honoring you to do that. 
So that is a part of it. But most of what we need to do is just lay everything else aside and think and concentrate on what Jesus has done for us so we can be saved. That I can be a son and you can be a son or a daughter of God and have all the benefits of eternal blessing coming to us right now, waiting for that time when it's going to be made complete down the road, either when Jesus comes or we go home to be with him, to have that happen right now in our lives as we celebrate communion together. So I'll close with that, and I'm just going to read these scriptures. He's talking about the night in which he was betrayed. He took bread and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner also he took after he took the cup after supper, saying, This is a new covenant in my blood. This do in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you show the Lord proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We are going to take all the work that Jesus did and celebrate it. That's the new covenant to make you and me children of God to do his work by his power. Amen. As we humble ourselves and present ourselves to him. So we're going to have the worship team come. And you know if you've been here before, if not, I'll just share. We, we hand out the bread first. Then we'll pray together before we eat it. And then we'll do the same and hand out the cup. We'll hold it, pray together, and take of it together. And remember the body and blood of our Lord, that he's the one that's making it all possible. So I can be his child of God, and I can do the work he wants me to do. We can have the servers come at this time, too.